Hi there, Dr. Alan Christensen here, and I want to tell you about the calcium paradox. There's so many really good questions we get about calcium. You know, do we need it? How much? What types? What about the heart attacks? Uh, how does it absorb? All these relevant factors, and they're, they're very important. And I'm super jazzed to give you all some clarity on this and make better sense out of it all. A lot of this was spawned by a study from the last year showing that vitamins raise the risk of heart attacks. And that's a pretty shocking headline, and rightfully so. The sad thing is that it's data that's not new. Vitamins can cause heart attacks. To be very specific, insoluble versions of calcium can cause heart attacks. So calcium does two very different things in the body. One is really good and one is awful. The good one we call mineralizing. So calcium is an important part of forming bone tissue, helping our muscles work right, and helping our nerves conduct signals properly. You know, when we lack it, we can have more muscular tension, more fatigue, uh, more, more stress. So it's a really critical thing. Now, the calcifying, that's kind of like the pearl forming in an oyster. When there's irritation, when there's inflammation in the body, calcification can grow around that, and it can cause masses to form, calcified masses. Some of these are small, some are more significant in size, but even the small ones can be critical. So when there's irritation in the blood vessels, that calcium growth creates calcification. That's a big part of how plaque forms in the body, and that's how heart disease sets up. And that's why studies have shown that many vitamins cause heart attacks, because those that have the insoluble calcium cause more plaque to form. Calcification is also a bad deal for your joints. We talk about joint calcification with arthritis, and it's the same process. An area that's chronically inflamed gets calcified, gets material built around that. This is also the process behind kidney stones and gallstones. So many ways it can go wrong. So why does calcium do bad things sometimes, good things other times? So there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the first ones is what type of calcium we're consuming. Calcium's soluble, it dissolves in water, or it's insoluble, it doesn't dissolve in water. You know, simple distinction. The insoluble types are more concentrated. They have more calcium per dose than others. They're just more dense, but they're also harder for the body to put in the right places. They're more apt to move around in the system and just passively attach to inflammation rather than actively contribute to mineralization and tissue repair. So that's the downside. So insoluble calcium, what does that mean in terms of our diet? Uh, pretty much dairy foods. So dairy foods contain calcium caseinate, and it's a very dense calcium. So per serving, you will see more impressive numbers of milligram. But in the body, that's calcium that doesn't do as many good things, and we've seen that. It's a paradox, but many papers have shown that cultures that have the highest dairy intake actually have higher rates of bone thinning. You know, it doesn't help the things that calcium should do for mineralization. We have also seen that those same cultures have higher rates of arthritis and then cardiovascular events. So that's the double-edged sword. In terms of supplements, the insoluble calcium would be calcium carbonate and oyster shell calcium and also bone-derived calcium or coral-derived calcium. Those are all types that do not readily dissolve in water. So what about the good kind of calcium? Well, it's a type that is more water soluble. And as a generalization, that's a kind of calcium we get from plant foods. You may hear about green foods, green leafy vegetables containing calcium. And oftentimes, they're not given as much attention as they deserve because the amount they contain is a lot lower in milligrams than you would find in calcium from dairy, for example. So even though it's fewer milligrams, it's much better absorbed and it's much more useful for the body. So the leafy greens have very helpful types of calcium. Uh, in supplements, the types we want to look for are going to be malate forms. So citrate malate and glycinate malate. Those are some of the preferred types. They're pretty cool. You don't need more than a few hundred milligrams. And that's because they're more efficiently absorbed and they're more extensively used for mineralization. There's not a whole lot of loss in absorption, and there's not a great amount of calcium lost to calcification, to inflammatory reactions. So they're safe, and they're much more efficient. They're much more important for us. 
And that's one big distinction on calcium doing good stuff, not bad stuff, is just what type we have. Another big factor is vitamin D status. So the more we have good amounts of vitamin D, the more we can regulate calcium, the more we can make sure it mineralizes and does not calcify. Vitamin D is something that in, our, in the past, our ancestors got it from the sunlight. You know, they were outside, they were more unclothed, and their skin reflected the amount of sun exposure they had. So darker skin blocks vitamin D synthesis. So if you have dark skin and you're out in the sun more constantly, you will get appropriate but not excessive amounts of vitamin D. White skin, light skin, allows it to absorb quicker. So if you're lighter complected, you're in European areas in the distant past, you would have less sun exposure than those would in more equatorial regions of the world, you know, Africa or the Middle East. So the lighter skin allows you to take up vitamin D more quickly from the less sun exposure. And it seems the opposite, but what happens is that the pigment blocks vitamin D formation. It's not that it's how much our skin absorbs, because yeah, just dark colors absorb more heat and more light, but no, the pigment that causes our skin to change in color changes how much we absorb vitamin D by blocking it. So our ancestors got more from the sun. There was also more that they got from animal foods, especially animal organs. They would eat quite a bit of organ tissue. <laughs> we don't as much. If we did have more liver, kidneys, or heart in our diet, we would maintain more of that. And the other factor is our bathing. So the fact that we bathe and shower regularly, that makes us less able to assimilate vitamin D on a regular basis. So vitamin D is something that pretty much have to take in supplemental form. And it's good to track as well. We now know that there's certain blood levels that yield wonderful health benefits. Current guidelines suggest 50 to 75 nanograms per mil. And people are different in terms of how much they take to achieve that range from one to the next. Average is about five to 10,000 units. There are some that need less, some that need more, but it's good to track and good to watch. And that'll help your body make sure calcium is behaving. <laughs> Another big nutrient, also fat soluble, is vitamin K. Vitamin K is named K because it was involved with clotting reactions. It was actually a German term for clotting that caused that to tie in. But vitamin K is also critical for helping calcium behave right. There is a compound called osteocalcin that allows calcium to mineralize, and vitamin K creates that effect to occur. Uh, vitamin K is also from leafy greens. So leafy greens, again, they've got some good versions of calcium, but they also have vitamin K, which helps us make good use of the calcium that we do have. Another relevant factor is our magnesium status. The better we are in magnesium, the more apt calcium is to do the right stuff. Magnesium is something that most of us are low in unless we are very strategic about our diets or we are supplementing with it. Some studies have shown that among people who report to emergency rooms, half or more are deficient in magnesium using tests that only show it when it's more advanced. So it's a big problem and it's super important for the health of your heart, the health of your bones. So in some cases, the bad things that calcium does are related simply to that lack of magnesium to properly balance it and oppose it. The densest food source of magnesium, the single densest one of commonly available foods would be adzuki beans. They're wonderful things. You also do see them spelled without the Z. So A-D-Z-U-K-I, adzuki, or A-D-U-K-I. They're small red beans, they're very tasty, and you can get them pre-cooked in canned forms in more so health food supermarkets or you can get them dry and they cook up pretty fast, faster than many other beans, and they're wonderful. Next best dense source would be almonds, and they're also a nice source of the magnesium, so good to have in the diet. And uh, pumpkin seeds are good sources as well, and then leafy greens are wonderful. Kind of a funny thing, but greens have a compound called chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is a lot like hemoglobin that we have in our blood, so it's kind of like plant blood. Our hemoglobin is iron-based, and that's why our blood's red. So plant chlorophyll is more magnesium-based, and that difference between magnesium and iron makes it green versus red. So plant blood has magnesium, human blood has iron. And the more green things we eat, the better we are in terms of our magnesium, our vitamin K, and our calcium status. So calcium, double-edged sword, you want to mineralize, you do not want to calcify. So eat your greens, tag on some calcium malate to the diet, 
And do be aware that calcium from dairy foods and from insoluble sources is counterproductive. Stay active, get some healthy sun, track your vitamin D, and you'll do great. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk again real soon.